So, section 9.1 begins the introductory part on fluids. Okay, we're going to look at three sections based on fluids. I find this to be really interesting, the stuff you learn in fluids. Okay, because it's all around you, whether you realize it or not. The air you're breathing in, okay, is considered to be a fluid. Now, don't confuse fluid with liquid. Okay, so there's three states of matter, right? There's solid, there's liquid, and there's gas. But liquids and gases are considered to be fluids. Okay, fluids. They behave very similarly, although we don't think of it that way. So when we open that window, and then I open the door, I open the door so there's a different pressure differential here. So it creates a draft, or it creates like a wind in the room. When the door is shut right now, there's not much going on, right? You don't feel as much, but if you open this door, now there's a different pressure out there, a different pressure in here, and temperature. When you have differences in temperature and pressure, it creates wind. So whenever you're talking about like storms and stuff, and you say low pressure centers, it's because of the pressure differential that you get air moving. So when we talk about fluids, the beginning of it here, this in itself, like this chapter, is expanded upon in college if you take, you know, engineering or specific types of science. And you'll spend an entire course on fluids themselves. Okay, so when I was a sophomore, I took fluid mechanics, where you spend the entire semester learning about the movement of fluids, how they occur, the difference in turbulence, um, and laminar flow. And then we do a lot of labs. Now, unfortunately, labs for stuff like that are like you need wind tunnels. So when I was in school, if you go to an engineering school, you'll have things like this, because you have big engineering labs. So you have these huge wind tunnels. You'll have turbines. You can look at thermodynamic properties. You can look at fluid mechanic properties in turbines. See how they spin, how they generate energy as a result of the draft or the lift or the drag on the airfoil. So we're going to take a look at the basics of things like flight and how the idea of flight was discovered. How if you have more lift under the wing or the airfoil and then you have drag on the wind, the object will start to take off. So the basics of the mechanics of fluids, that's what this whole idea is. Okay, but again, there's so much more to it similar to the other things that we've studied already. So today we're going to look, or this section, we're going to look at defining a fluid, distinguishing between a liquid and a gas, because they're both fluids, calculating and defining the buoyant force, and finally discussing floating objects and what their properties are. Who can tell me something they know about one of those four things already, before we even get into this? Out of the four different topics or objectives there, what's something you know about one of them maybe? Maria? Well, objects float, for example, in water, if their density is smaller. That's exactly right. If their density is less than water, they float. We've always learned that. We're going to prove that mathematically, and you're going to see how that actually works out. That is absolutely right. Good. I saw other hands. Nick? Doesn't like buoyancy correspond to the amount of water displaced? That's absolutely right. The force of buoyancy pushing you up is equal and opposite to that of the amount of water displaced or the weight of the amount of water displaced. So if I go into, if I jump into a pool and I take up a certain amount of volume, that volume in water, the weight of that is the force pushing back up. Now, if my body weighs more than water, or if I'm more dense than water, I sink. Now, bodies though, can expand and contract, right? They have variable densities. If I do this, <sighs> did my density just get less or more? Less. Less. And that's why when you've taken a lot of air, you will float in a pool. Have you ever breathed out all the air in your lungs when you're at the bottom of a pool? What will you do? You'll stay at the bottom down there. Try one time. Swim down to the bottom. You don't drown. You, no, you'll be fine for like at least an, almost like 30 seconds to a minute without any air. You swim down, swim down to the bottom of the pool, right? Blow all the air out of your lungs. What you're doing is you're, you're lowering your volume by blowing all the air out. When you lower your volume, you become more dense. Your density becomes greater than water, you'll stay at the bottom. Now, while you're at the bottom, you can't obviously breathe in air. But imagine you had a scuba tank next to you. And you could just breathe in all that air at the bottom, and then it would cause you to float back up to the surface. Okay? Now, what else do we know? What else? Stop, Mike. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, doesn't like, does it have like a, like a volume, like a, like a, I'm not. Stop, you know, he's, I'm good. <laughs> no, that was so mean, buddy. <laughs> Go ahead, Joyce. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Careful. <laughs> iPad down. <laughs> Joyce, continue your statement. And with gas, doesn't right? Yeah, so volume, <laughs> the volume of a liquid is constant. Its shape changes based on the container, 
but a gas takes up whatever space it's occupying, right? <laughs> Anything else that you know prior to what we discussed? Already discussed? All right, let's keep going. What fluid is? You don't have to write this down, obviously. It's in your notes already. So can I get you to read for us, please, nice and loud? Awesome. Fluid. A flowing state of matter that has no fixed shape whose molecules are able to move past each other. Okay, so either one of them. As long as it is a flowing, flowing free shape, okay, it can take upon the it can take the shape of the containers in for a liquid always, for a gas sometimes. Okay, it depends on the situation for the gas. The liquid for us, the liquid. Um, a substance with definite volume or definite shape traditionally takes the shape of its container. And finally, what? Substance with definite volume or definite shape traditionally takes the shape of its container. And finally, a gas. A gas. Scotty, a gas. A substance with neither Okay, so now a gas can only contain, or can only be contained by a certain shape if that shape is sealed. Or in the case of like a hot air balloon, where the air is hotter, so it wants to rise, so it billows, and it causes that balloon to create. And all that hot air is in there, it's trapped by the actual, uh, what's the word in boat, word for boats, the uh, sail. Okay, it acts like a sail. All right. Um, the, the next. Obviously, we've always seen these stupid cat ones, but it's, it's funny. So you say cats are liquid because they are a constant volume, and they adapt to the shape of the container. Okay, now obviously they're not liquid, but that's the idea of a liquid. When it's poured into a container, okay, it takes the shape of the container. After that, so I thought I'd throw it in the notes for once. Uh, density. Density. Now, please, there's a big difference here. Relax, guys. There's a big difference here in density and mass density. Okay, so let's really emphasize the two. So density is the quantity or the amount of a substance in a given amount of space. So like, for example, you could have population density. Where is there a higher population density? New York City or Texas? New York. Texas. Uh, population density? Texas. New York City or Texas? Uh, New York City. If you know geography at all, New York City for sure. Okay, density, density. Now, Wait, overall population, <laughs> overall population is one thing, but a population density means like a concentration of people. So right now in this room, there's 17, no, 16 of us. Yeah, I realize that, 16 of us. So we would say 16 people per room. That would be our density. If we started packing in a lot more people, what happens? People get closer, the molecules get closer, it becomes more dense, right? So density is a concentration of anything. Now, mass density is what you always learn about in science. Are we clear on this? Because a lot of you are not going to go into maybe a field in science that has mass density, but maybe you'll go into economics. Or maybe you'll look into something like politics or law. You need to know what density means, generally speaking. So the density of something is a concentration of a substance. Okay? Mass density, for this course and for anybody that takes physics, Okay, in college, no mass density, or even volume or cap, you know, no mass density also. What is that symbol on the left? Anybody remember? Have you ever seen it before? It means density, but what does it stand for? Um, no one ever seen this one? Right? Delta Phi. Oh, we did this. Rho? Did we do this last week? Yeah. I mentioned Rho. It was like, a, like a one of these. Remember, it was like a squiggly? Yeah. Yeah. That's how the computer I mean. Uh, right? I don't know. I always drew it like this in college, and I've been used to that. But the, the computer does it like that. Anyway, rho is density, or mass density. And clearly, it's going to be a function of mass and volume. Okay, so it's mass over volume. So if your mass increases, without your volume increases, you become more dense. Okay, you become more dense. So people say that people that have more muscle than fat are more dense. And that's true. And you say, you ever hear the saying, muscle weighs more than fat? Yeah. It doesn't actually weigh more than fat, it's more dense than fat. Muscle is actually more dense than fat molecules. So somebody that's like a bodybuilder might be the exact same size as someone who doesn't really weight train at all. Same volume. But the person who's a bodybuilder will be heavier. They'll have more weight because they're more dense. Muscle is more dense than fat. So again, the difference, okay, you have to have a lot more mass to be more dense, or take up less volume, okay? Or take up less volume. So if you had, let's see. 
trying to think of an example. <laughs> the rock. Or well, if you're making fun of yourself, no, just call someone dense, I mean, usually that's not the very... The Rock? Like the movie The Rock? <laughs> oh, The Rock. Sure, I meant another example outside of bodybuilders. Sorry. Not an example of a bodybuilder. He's got to be. Yeah. It's kind of a but if you were to show like a full-sized person, like in a small space, would that density be larger than like the density of New York? Or like living density? I'm confused. Well, you're talking about like a small room, right? Like in this room? Yeah, like a really small room. Like, like, like a lot like of closet. If you shoved a person But what's the volume of New York? You can't really make an answer to that. Like but there's... Fun, strong, yeah. There's Do you follow what I'm saying though? What's the volume of New York? There's a kind of living density or whatever the term is for New York. It's like a dense... Yeah, the, the living density of a person in a small closet would be greater than that of New York, sure. You're not literally like this in New York unless you're on the subway, right? Yeah. So, so yes, it would be more dense than the living density of New York. But that's not a... You can't really say that. Cause that's what's, what's the, question. Yeah, there's no volume to New York. I start with this. This is a stupid question. Neutron stars are? Are they like the most dense thing? Besides black hole? Wow. Now, how do you, again, what's Brooklyn in volume, right? Like, like, I know. Like, if Brooklyn was like this, the and like open up to a sphere, okay. Did you hear about the iceberg? I didn't. Tell me about the iceberg. It's no, that's like three times the size of Manhattan. Where? It like broke up the entire thing. And is it floating toward us? Is it going to be like... They're like tracking That's wild. You hear that? An iceberg three times the size of Manhattan broke off of Antarctica? In the south? That's crazy. How does that work, by the way? How does ice float? Oh, aren't they like, aren't they like, it's less dense than water. Yeah, but solids are always more dense than liquids. No. Is it because it's frozen? Yeah, they are. It is. Yeah. Everything yeah. except for it's water. Got good boy, no. it's, got it's got a good triple point. point. It's defying <laughs> gravity. It's Son, I'm not defying not physics. <laughs> it's in a wind tunnel. It's a liquid. It's less. It's less dense. It's got a flow. Yes. Hold on. Hold on. I heard, I heard the answer, go ahead. Yeah. So when hydrogen bonds... Guys, come on, focus. You're way off, top, off topic. When hydrogen bonds become solids, the crystalline structure becomes more of an obtuse angle. So that's through the angle of the bond. The bond, I think, is like 115 degrees in like a liquid, and then when, and this is only water, it's a very rare example, because most solids get more dense than their liquid form. But when water, okay, changes into a solid, the bonds actually get wider or more obtuse. So the density of ice is less than that of water, because it occupies more volume. You know how you know that? You all should know this. You put water in an ice tray, and you only fill it up to the top, but it always puffs up, doesn't it? Yeah. It it's the same amount of mass. The mass didn't increase, so what increased? The <coughs> no, come on. I'm so confused. Sorry. And if the mass didn't increase, the volume. the volume increased. Well, if the denominator gets bigger, you're dividing by a bigger number. So your density has to get smaller. Take 5 and divide it by 5. Well, density is 1. But then take 5 and divide it by 10. Now the density is 1 half, right? So as the volume increases, the density decreases. They're indirectly related, as we would say, as we would state in physics. As the mass increases, the density increases, though. So if I add salt to water, what happens? The density increases. Yeah, because I'm adding mass, and that mass is dissolved in the water. There's almost no increase in volume when I add salt to the water. Until I break the saturation point, and then the salt just starts piling up on the bottom, then clearly I'm increasing the volume. But the salt that's absorbed by the liquid, the volume increase is almost insignificant. Wait, what do you, what do you mean? Like, so if you I add salt to water, for a while it's going to be absorbed into the water, yeah. dissolved in, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm increasing the mass of the fluid, but I'm not really increasing the volume. Okay? Yeah. Now, 
once it becomes super saturated, no more salt can become dissolved. And there's a certain point. It's called the saturation oh, point. The salt sucks it all up. And all of a sudden, if you keep adding salt, it's not going to all go into the water. Eventually, you'll start building, forming like a layer of salt on the bottom. No. And at that point, you are increasing the volume also. So then you're increasing the mass and the volume, and it gets a little tricky. But for the beginning, when you keep adding salt into that water, you're just increasing the mass. So by, by default, you're increasing the density. We'll do a quick demo of that tomorrow in class. Okay. Now, here's something to note. Something you should write down. Most solids and liquids are what are called incompressible. Most solids and liquids are incompressible, meaning you can't compress them any more than they are. Whereas a gas, though, and you know this, a gas, the pressure can change. They are compressible. Which is why, like, when you pump up your tire, you are increasing the pressure, correct? Have you ever pumped up your tire? You're increasing the pressure. Yeah, like, when you fart, what do you do, Mike? Yeah, you're decreasing the pressure in your body. I heard you say it, so I'm going to call you out. So when you fart, you're decreasing the pressure. When you put air in the tires, you're increasing the pressure. So gas, gases in general are compressible. You can be adding more gas to a fixed volume and make it more dense. Whereas a liquid and a solid, though, most, again, I say most because there's exceptions, most liquids and solids are incompressible. Try and compress the wood on your desk with your bare hand. It's pretty impossible to do that, obviously. Okay? We know, yeah, sure. Maybe if you had a machine, you could do it, or a vice grip. You could put an indentation in there and compress it a little bit. But if you have a straight, like an, uh, an isotropic solid, like a metal, okay, you're not able to compress it. So, then, so is water one of those exceptions? Because when you get deeper in water, the pressure is... No, 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 no. It's not... Okay. That is the pressure on your body that you're feeling from the weight of the water above you. But the water itself is not increasing its pressure. Or it's not... The water is not becoming... The molecules are not getting closer in the water as you go down further. The fluid itself is not compressing. It's you that is feeling the pressure of the fluid on you. That's a little bit different, okay? Have you ever seen when the guy opens the can of coke like really deep in the water? What happens? It probably goes oh, crazy. Goes like oh, because the pressure is so high that yeah. it's keeping it in. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. Well, you can barely see. He has like a flashlight. Yeah. Maybe we can pull up the video. Yeah. If you can remind me. Or you can email me a link to the video right now. That'd be even better. All right. Let's go to example one. Can I get someone to read example one, please? Awesome, Regina. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the density of mercury is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. Yeah, cubic meter or meter cube, good. And there's a 250 kilogram meteorite at the lab. How much volume would the object displace if submerged in a tank of water? All right, so let's think about this logically. It's a dense, it's a... It's a chamber of mercury. I'll make mercury red. I don't know why. Now, we take a meteorite. I guess I should make that green, right, Superman fans? Uh, take a meteorite, drop it into the mercury. What's going to happen to the level of mercury? It goes up. Whose principle is that? Whose principle? Somebody had to do a project on this chubby guy. <laughs> he did it in a bath. He got in a bathtub in the water, spilled out the side. He got stuck in a bathtub. That's different. This is a scientist that, when entering a bathtub, realized the water rises up and the volume of the water oh displaced is equal to. No. <laughs> scientist! Oh, um, four. Oh, wait. No, no, somebody, at least Socrates. Not Socrates. Did he say Eureka? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. He may have. It's possible. What shape is this? Archimedes. There it is. Arc. Archimedes. Archimedes principle. He may have. It's either him or Einstein. That said Eureka. I don't know. No, I think it was like Einstein who discovered something in a bathtub. Something with Eureka, yeah. 
All right, so the meteorite is placed into the mercury and the volume will increase. The question becomes, how much volume would the object displace? So how much would this, how much would this rise up? So here's the new level when the meteorite is now in the water. Okay, it's moved up to that black line there. So we want to find out how much additional volume has this level of mercury raised by. So pretty much what is the volume of the meteorite itself? Okay, if we can find the meteorite's volume, we know how much fluid has been displaced. Okay, so let's go ahead and think about that. So we have, we want to solve for volume. So what does volume equal? Uh, Very good. Okay, switch them, please. Take the mass, which is 250 kilograms, over rho, which is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. What happens to kilograms over kilograms? Meters cubed in the denominator of the denominator goes up to the numerator. Yeah, and now we also in this sense have, it's one over m cubed, not one third, but I get what you're saying. Uh, so we have now volume, which is in meters cubed. Okay, 250 over 1,000 is 0.25. Why doesn't it say 1 over m to the third? It does, because when I replace this, there's a 1 there and there's really a 1 there. Oh, okay. I'm just not putting it there. But remember, when you have a fraction in the denominator, you really multiply by the reciprocal. So oh, take the reciprocal and multiply it up top, putting meters cubed as the numerator's units. Okay? <laughs> and remember, what are you looking for? Volume. Volume is measured in cubic meters. Remember, volume is easiest thought of as length times width times height for any rectangular solid. Okay, length times width times height. Okay, simple enough. Ev, did you email me that video? All right, let's, let's pause here for today and watch that video. The buoyant force is analogous to normal force. Analogous to normal force in the sense that it acts the same way. The buoyant force acts as a reactive force in response to the weight of an object pushing down on a fluid. Okay? Now, the buoyant force can vary, obviously, and it depends on the density of the fluid, how much of the object is actually submerged. We'll see exactly today how we can figure that out. Right now, am I feeling a buoyant force? No. Yes. No. Which one? You're absolutely right, Nick. I'm in a fluid, aren't I? No. What? Is it a gas, a fluid? Yes, you are. So fluid? technically speaking, oh. I am feeling a buoyant force. Now, my density is so much greater than the density of air around me that it is literally not even there. You don't notice it, okay? There is a buoyant force. Now, if I were to jump from this chair to the ground, I'm hitting the bottom of the ocean, of the air around me. Oh my God. Okay, which is weird to think about, right? But that's what I'm doing. It's an ocean of air around me, and as I jump, I hit the bottom of the ocean, which relative to where I'm standing is to me the bottom, outside of me, further. Now, if you jump in water, though, you don't necessarily go right to the bottom because of the buoyant force. The buoyant force is felt in water because the density of water is so great. Okay? Now, We've already discussed the idea that if you are more dense than water, you will sink. Let's go ahead and go through some work and prove this today as well. The second thing we want to look at is apparent weight. Apparent weight is the weight you feel like when you're in a fluid. So for example, when you're swimming in a pool, when you're swimming in a pool and you're underwater, you don't feel the same weight you would feel if you were outside. You feel like you weigh less. If you're at the beach and you're floating in the water, it's salt water, it's pretty easy to float in salt water. It's very dense. So you float a lot. You feel weightless, really. You feel like you're just cruising, sitting there, okay? Floating back and forth. You feel weightless. How could you feel weightless? How could that be possible? If... Hold the mic. The buoyant force. If... The buoyant force. The force the, the buoyant force equals the force of the weight. Yes. If the buoyant force equals the force of your weight or your weight in general, the force of gravity, if we use the term force. If the buoyant force can be equal and opposite to your weight, you will float at the top. Is that clear? Now, if the buoyant force is less than your weight, your weight's going to overcome it and then you're going to sink. 
you're going to sin. All right? So we've got a few different scenarios here. Now, let's, before we get into this, quickly, this principle, although we already did discuss it, but there's some things I want to uh, point out. First, in scenario number one, I know it's difficult to see the water level. Let me highlight where that is. Here's the water level. All right? In scenario number one, the object is out of the water, so no, no water has been displaced. In scenario number two, the object is partially submerged. This part of the object is submerged. Okay, the part that I'm color oh, you can't even see that, can you? The part that's under the water line, which I'll draw, you can see the water line at least. Okay, the part under the water line is submerged, and some of the water is pouring out here and filling up this beaker on the side. Okay? So the water pours out. The water that is poured out has equal volume to the amount of the object that has been submerged. So the volume of the object, the part that has been submerged, is equal to the volume of the fluid displaced. This is in part two here. Exactly, that's exactly right. Now we're just showing that instead of the water level moving up and measuring with a graduated cylinder, the water is going to be displaced out that like side exit and it's going to end up in a beaker on the side. In the third case, what happened to the object? It's not partially submerged. It's fully submerged. It's fully submerged. Here's the water level up here. Now in the third case, the volume of the object is equal to the volume of the fluid displaced. Why don't I have to write submerged in the third case? Huh? You can tell what? That it is submerged. Yeah, that the whole thing is submerged. There's no need to specify the part that we're talking about. Whereas in this part, it was the volume of the object that was partially submerged. The part that was under. So let's say the volume of the object happens to be 2 cubic meters. In the third case, the volume of the fluid, this volume, is 2 cubic meters. Because it's been fully submerged. But in this case, we know that the volume that's come out of here is something less than 2 cubic meters, right? Because it's not fully submerged. So here's the way to think about it. I'm standing here in the pool. Here's the water level of the pool. Only part of my legs are under the water, right? So only some of the water has been displaced. And I go further into the water. Now up to here in my body is underwater. So my legs, the volume of them, are displacing that volume of water. So VF is the volume of my legs from here down right now. But then when I'm fully under the water, I'm fully under, we believe, obviously, the entire volume of my body is equal to the volume of the fluid that has been displaced. So as I am submerged further and further, VF goes up. The volume of the fluid displaced increases as my body is submerged further. Until I'm fully submerged, then VF is just VO. Again, you can write this down in words. VF increases as the object is submerged more and more until it is fully submerged. That's absolutely right. You put ice in the cup, the water level rises up. Now when the ice is fully submerged, the amount of water level that rose up is the exact volume of that ice. It's going to change because ice melts, but we'll make believe it doesn't melt. Okay? But when you get to the bath, it's the amount? Yeah, the amount of water that rises up in volume is equal to the volume of your body. Say you're fully in the bath, and the bath water is up to here, of your body from there down. Okay? Until you are fully submerged... Once you're fully submerged, the amount of water that has been displaced is at a maximum value. You can't displace any more water. Watch. I'm all the way under the water. If I move further down the water, it doesn't displace any more water because I'm still the same person. There's no more volume of me if I move down further. Like if I move this little red brick to the left side or the right side, it's still going to displace the same amount of water. If the brick were here, let's say instead the brick were right here. Still fully submerged, but right there instead. It's still going to displace the same amount of water. So again, the volume of the fluid displaced increases 
as I'm submerged more and more into the water. Until I'm fully submerged, then VO equals VF. Then the volume of the fluid displaced is at a max. It is equal to the volume of the object. All right? Now, mathematically, oh, God. They get a really dense gas, gas. Yeah. And, and they put it into like a fish tank and then they put like aluminum foil below and it like floats on the gas. And then they like gas. No way. Yeah, it's sort of gas. Can you link me while we're reading? We'll do it at the end of class. That's awesome. That's so cool. So that's that's actually that's actually does scale. 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 That's all right, so before we go further, here's what I want to do. I want to talk real quick about, let me see what I want to talk about. The force of buoyancy. Can I get someone to read the statement at the top? Because we haven't actually read the statement yet. Scott? Any object completely or partially submerged in fluid experiences an upward buoyant force equal in magnitude to the weight of the fluid to the weight of the fluid displaced. So see this beaker on the far right? I'll point to it. Look over here, please. The weight of this water, the amount of weight, if you were to put it on a scale, is equal to the force of buoyancy pushing back up on this rock. Clearly, this force of buoyancy is not enough. The rock must weigh more. Okay? So the weight of the rock or the stone or whatever this is, the brick, is more than the weight of this water that has been displaced. Thus, it sinks. So let's write that down variably now. Mr. Al, would more of the water come out if the thing was floating on the bottom? If what was floating on the bottom? If the stone or something. Once it's fully submerged, no more water comes out. Oh, okay. It's the most water that can come out. So this statement says, the upward buoyant force, so FB, please write this, is equal in magnitude to the weight of the fluid displaced, equals... The weight of the fluid displaced. I'm going to put FGF. FG means weight. F means, little f means? Gravity. Oh. Fluid. Fluid. G means gravity. Little f means fluid. Okay, again, FG is weight. Did you and say G? No, I said F. <laughs> and F stands for fluid. Now, how do you find the weight of any object? Anything. Fg equals? Mg. Why am I putting that little f there to stand for the mass of the fluid? But, but, write a little side note over here. Rho equals mass over volume, doesn't it? So if we solve for mass, what do we get? How do I get rid of a V if it's being divided? Uh, Rho V is mass, right? Please, 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 everybody look right here. This is something by the end of this lesson in lesson 9-2 and 9-3, you will have memorized. You can always replace mass with Rho V. Alright? So I replace mass right here with Rho V. So what does that tell me? This tells me the following. This is our conclusion. This will always be the buoyant force. Always, always, always. So what things can you say? As the density of the fluid goes up, the buoyant force goes up. That makes sense. If I am suddenly, instead of being in water, I dive in a bath of honey. And honey is very dense and <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> mercury. Is that better, Mike? Yes. <laughs> mercury. So you dive in a bowl of mercury. Mercury is a lot more dense than water. You would most likely float in mercury. Listen, listen. You would most likely float in mercury because the density is so great. If you could increase your volume without changing your mass, how would you do that? You take a breath. <gasps> increase your volume. If you increase your volume, 
you're increasing the amount of fluid that's been displaced. So as VF goes up, the, the force of buoyancy goes up. When we do that competition for the lab on Friday, is it Friday for you guys? No, it's Monday. No. We have 9-2, uh, we have 9-1 again another day. We have a review on Friday. Then on Monday we're going to do a lab the first period of competition. The second period is your test on Monday, but the lab will help you for the test. Yeah, your next test is Monday, don't forget. So soon. We tell our lab is Tuesday. I know, crazy, right? Boom. I don't know. You can look it up. I don't know. Let's just cancel tests. And it's probably something like mercury because it's at room temperature and liquid, which is very rare. Cancel it all. Okay. We're not going to call that stuff. No. Anyway, so the force of buoyancy, the force of buoyancy, is directly related to the density of the fluid and the amount of fluid that has been displaced. Please keep, write a little star down on the side. Use this in that lab on Monday. So many groups forget to use this theory. Okay? Keep that theory in the back of your mind on Monday when we do that competition. The best group is the best grade. Okay, that's how it's going to work. You're going to be in pairs on Monday. All right. I will tell you on Monday. I'm not going to give it away. Okay? During the first period, we have a double on Monday. Second period, we'll have the test. Do I need a sweatband? If you want to bring a sweatband, you can bring a sweatband. Sure. Alright? Sinking versus floating. <laughs> let's, let's start with a free body diagram of an object that is in a fluid. If this object is either submerged, floating, partially submerged, whatever. Okay, if this object is in a fluid, what forces does it feel on it? Free body diagram, what does it feel? Is it sinking or floating? Doesn't matter. It always feels a buoyant force. And? Gravity. That's it. Again, you take an object, throw it in a vat of water, it's going to either sink or float. Whether it sinks or float, it still feels both these forces. Nick, when will it sink? If? If the uh, force of gravity is greater than the buoyant force. Exactly. When will it float, Bobby, if? if the yeah. So in this case, we're looking at a balance here. If one is bigger than the other, we have floating or sinking. Is that clear? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Maria. How come some objects kind of like don't sink all the way to Okay. That has to do with a variable density in the water. Sometimes water's density can change as a function of its depth. Not by much, though. So if that object happened to be an exact density of the fluid at that height, it will pause there and like kind of be suspended in air. And we're going to see that. I'm going to do an example of this with an egg. You guys don't have class tomorrow, right? I'm going to do, yeah, because we didn't get to it in the other class. We're not going to get to it here either. Okay? Day three. So we will do it tomorrow, and you'll see that with an A, okay? And I'll show you what I mean. So let's look, let's look and think for a moment about the net force acting on this object. Okay, the net force acting on this object is equal to FB minus FG. Everybody agree? FB pushes up, FG pushes down. Now, if the net force is negative, the object moves down. So if I could say that this quantity is less than zero, it moves down. Well, this is also true because look, if gravity has more of an effect than the buoyant force, Nick told us a moment ago, the object sinks, doesn't it? It sinks. So this is sinking on the right hand side because if the net force is negative, it moves down. It sinks. Again, this is sinking, so let's write sinking here. It is sinking because the difference between these two is negative or less than zero because gravity is bigger than the buoyant force. When you take a big number and subtract it from a smaller number, you get a negative answer. So in this case, gravity is bigger than the buoyant force. Let's go ahead and move that around. 
Let's add FG over to the right hand side, please. And that makes sense, right? Nick, doesn't this make sense? It correlates with your statement. Gravity is bigger than the buoyant force. We are sinking. We are sinking. Now, let's prove that with density. What was the formula for the buoyant force in the last slide? We wrote it down and boxed it in. I said, remember for your lab. Yeah, rho F, V F, G. It's capital V. And that is less than the mass of the object, or the weight of the object. How do I find the weight of the object? M G. I'm putting an O to stand for? Object. object. Let's keep going with this. Let's keep going with this. Mass on the right hand side is really equal to what? I solved for it earlier. I said you're going to have to remember this. Rho V. In the last slide, we solved for mass. We said, I said, remember, mass is equal to rho V. Mike, stop and focus. So mass is equal to rho V. But why am I putting zeros there or O's? Object. The object. Now, Smitty. The object is fully submerged. What can you say about VF and VO? Smitty. It's it Smitty. VF is Okay. I guess it could be greater if it splashed out more, but assuming it went in smoothly, it is not greater than or equal to just? Just equal. Just equal. If I submerge this thermos underwater, the amount of volume that would leak out or over the top would be the volume of this thermos from the entire outside walls included. Okay? So, VO and VF are equal when an object sinks. So since they're equal, I don't need subscripts anymore. Oops. I don't need my subscripts for V anymore. I still need them for the density because they're different, clearly. If V and G are on both sides of the equation, what can I do? Cancel them out. Divide both sides. So what do you get as a result? Let's take a look. Let's take a look at our conclusion. This is when an object sinks. If you sink, aren't you more dense than the fluid? Well, read the equation from right to left. The density of the object is greater than, because we're going this way now, right to left, the density of the fluid. Or you could say it, the density of the fluid is less than the density of the object. This is where that theory comes from. Your equations of motion, your balance. Now, if you are floating, the buoyant force equals the gravitational force. So instead of a less than symbol in the beginning here, this would be an equal to symbol. Whenever you're floating, it can't be greater than. If the buoyant force is bigger than the force of gravity, it would literally push you out of the water. I mean, I guess theoretically you could lay on the top, but then you'd be walking on water. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus can get the buoyant force to be greater than the gravitational force. But physically, okay, physics, in physics terms, the buoyant force can only be equal to the gravitational force. Focus, focus, focus. So, I'm going to write floating. Shh. I'm going to write floating. Am I going to resolve the whole thing? No. The equations are identical, except there's an equal sign here. So come up with the conclusion and just put an equal sign. Okay, if the densities are equal to each other, well, then the object will float. Well, it might partially float. Now, there is one thing, though. The density of the fluid... <coughs> could be greater than the density of the object, and then you're floating also. But we can't put the greater than symbol in the beginning of this problem because the buoyant force can't really be greater than the gravitational force. Okay? But this conclusion is true, and this conclusion is true. This is for sinking, Thank you. Wait. and these two could be true for floating. Wait, Either I, one. Isn't that what I said though? Like... No. This is saying that the, the density of the fluid is bigger than the density of the object. That could happen. But the buoyant force cannot actually be bigger. Oh, okay. okay, what will happen is, if the density of the fluid is greater than the density of the water, it will only be partially submerged, or partially floating. Oh. Part of it will be sticking out of the surface. Alright? 
All right, that was a lot there. That was a whole lot. What you need to remember is the idea at the end. That when an object is sinking, this is true. When it's floating, these two could be true. Okay? Make sense? All right. The next slide, skip for a moment, because we're going to do that part tomorrow. All right, so, start first. Okay? We're going to start by just pouring a little bit of water in the cup. Now, the, what do you complete guess? Raise your hand if you think an egg is more dense than water. Yes. If you think it's more dense than water, meaning it'll sink. Raise your hand if you don't think that. I don't know. Raise your hand if you're confused or didn't even answer. Yeah. Okay. So, if you take an egg, okay, and drop it in water, it has to sink. The density of the egg is greater than that of water. Okay? So clearly it is sunk to the bottom. You can all see it, right? Now, what I said the other day was this. If I add salt to the water, what am I doing to the water's density? Yeah, I'm making it more dense. So do me a favor, and let's draw this as the first case. So, oops. Let's draw a cup, a little bit of water in it, and an egg at the bottom. And we'll say the density of the object is greater than the density of the fluid. That's the first case. Right now, I remove the egg just temporarily because I don't want to get waterlogged or whatever. And I'm going to add salt. It takes a lot of salt. So I'm going to add a good amount first. And I'm going to stir it up. So what I'm doing is I'm adding mass to the water. Okay, we're really not changing the volume much. So as a result, we're increasing the density. Now, obviously, like I said, it becomes super saturated and there are sediments on the bottom. Okay? But the density, I'm going to add a little bit more water so it's not as... Okay, so the density is increased. It's now salt water. And just for your own reference, fresh water density is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Salt water, like the ocean, is approximately 1,025. So it's a small, significant, it's a small uh, almost insignificant change, but when you're in the ocean, you can feel the difference, like versus a pool. You really do feel the salt holding up more. Yeah. Uh, Tyler, you gave a good example that we were talking about. What was it? The, the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. Yeah. The Dead Sea, you can literally oh, float, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like no problem, you can lay on your back. Because the salt content is so high that the density of the Dead Sea is much larger than normal salt water. Okay? Now, I take the egg, I drop it in. If the egg somewhat floats, we'll get close. But I'm gonna tell you now that it's probably still gonna, yeah, still gonna sink. Which tells me that although I've increased the density of the fluid, I have not increased it enough. I have to keep adding salt. Now, if I add a little bit of salt, Okay, a little bit at a time, and stir it up. I may or may not see what I want to see right away. And was it going to magically just go up as you have? Let's take a look. It's still currently, right, so it's still, the object is more dense than the fluid. I need to do slowly, you'll see why. If I do too quick, it'll jump. Oh, ooh. Oh, it kind of jumped for a minute there, but... This is black energy. It's still settled out though, right? See that? Although it popped up at first, it's still settled out. The reason it popped up was just a little bit of... Uh, like a vortex below it? One, one, not a vortex, but when, a vortex. when something moves the fluid, it's going to create lift or blow. Still at the bottom, so we still want to add more. Okay, hold up, hold up, let's see. There it goes, okay, ready? So see how it's partially submerged, or it's fully submerged, but it's suspended in the water right now? So at this point in time, the egg's density is equal. Remember that was that in, in between stage. When the egg's density is less, it'll float to the top. So currently, we're in scenario two, where we've added a little bit of salt, right? We've added NaCl, table salt, and now we know that the density of the object is equal to the density of the fluid. Um, is okay. If, if it's any part, it's uh, floating. Or it's if it's suspended, suspended it's always point. equal. Yeah, so I could really, believe it or not, I don't know if it's going to work with this, but I could move it up a little bit and it might stay. Yeah, see how it kind of stays there now? Yeah. So it doesn't matter. It's, it's, the reason it's floating back down is because when you add salt to water, it creates a variable density. The water at the bottom is more dense than the water at the top. So it's going to stay above that bottom lower dense layer. That's what I was talking about with forensic science. Okay? So there's dense water down here and not as dense water here. So the egg is somewhere in between that, but we'll say it's equal to the density. Now, 
assuming it's, it's, uh, it's the same density throughout, isotropic. If I continue to add salt, what's going to happen? Does this help people find like, how long a person's been dead and how long? Oh, it's almost at the top. It's, oh, there it goes. And it's just, it's just above the surface of the water. If I keep adding salt, now what happens? Take a look. We can clearly see the egg is above the surface. If I hold it still. If it is, it is. It's bobbing back and forth. Okay. You can clearly see it. Can you guys see it from there or no? Yeah. The top of the egg is just exposed out of the water. And if I keep adding more and more salt, obviously, okay, and I continue to actually stir this so that I'm actually <coughs> The egg should come out a little bit further out of the water or easily protrude out of the water. A little bit more. It's more significant when you look from above. I know you guys are at the side. But you can see the top of the egg popping out of the water. Okay? Yeah, sure. So remember yesterday when we did that example with the mercury ball bearing? And part of it was floating and part of it was in the water. And we were able to determine the amount of volume that was floating. The idea here is the same thing. So what I want to say in the next part is this. Uh, these are if you boil it, does it make a difference? you hard boil the egg? Yeah. Uh, I think the density does change because then it becomes a solid. Yeah. So I'm not sure about the chemistry behind what's going on there. But I'm, I'm guessing it does. Is the salt so shallow? So if you left the egg in over a long enough time, the shell is semi-permeable. Semi-permeable. So that salt water will infuse into the egg and it'll find like an equilibrium. But you have to leave it in there for a while. Is that how they find like how long the person can be dead? No, usually death has to do with markings in the body and what's in the body and how the body is deformed. Okay. Yeah, it's post-mortem index. There's a lot actually goes into that, not just, yeah. not just this at all. Well, it depends on the stage the body is in, in decomposition. Because certain gases are released out of the body at a certain part of decomposition, which then cause the body to then sink after. So it really depends on that. Let's draw the third case. Now, in this third case, the density of the object is less than the density of the fluid. Okay? And I know that's exaggerating it, but that's what it looks like. The density of the object is less than the density of the fluid. Well, that's going to be loud in the recording. Um, what I do want to note, though, is this. And this is the interesting part. This is the really interesting part. At this point in time, gravity was greater than buoyancy. Right? So it sunk. Here, gravity and buoyancy were equal to each other. That's what enables it to be in a state of equilibrium or suspension in there. Even at the end, though, gravity and buoyancy are still equal. Buoyancy is greater than gravity for a little while, while that egg is rushing to the surface. Buoyancy is a little bit bigger than gravity when it pushes it up. But once it comes to the top of the surface and it sits there and it's at rest now, buoyancy and gravity are still the same. Now here's the really cool part. What is the definition of buoyancy from yesterday? Or what is the formula for buoyancy? Who remembers the formula for buoyancy? Oh, uh, B equals uh, e -F -E -F -G. Good. Rho F V F G. Oh, yeah. Oh. Rho F V F G. Now, the weight F G is not going to change. So pick a number. Four. Four. Let's say that the weight is four newtons. Well, you know what? In this third case, what's the weight of the egg still? Four. four newtons. Now, here's the cool part. Take a look at our formula. The formula is the same. It's still rho F, V, F, G, F, right? This formula is still the same. But look, the fluid's density was currently equal, and now the fluid's density is greater. So what happened to the fluid's density? When we were adding salt, what was happening to the density of that water? It was increasing, it was going up. So this value was going up, wasn't it? How could that happen? How could the density go up and yet we still get 4 as our answer when we multiply these two values? That's how you find how much is up, right? So it's just like the difference. You're on the right track. And finish that off. The volume goes down. The volume of the fluid goes down. The fluid displaced. Let's talk about that. This has to go down. And think about it for a second. If you multiply two things and you get four as an answer, and then one of those things goes up, the other has to go down to still get four as an answer. 
right? 8 times 1 half is 4. 4 times 1 is 4. You're still going to change the number, but if one goes up, the other goes down. The reason the volume of the fluid displaced goes down, look back up here. Here's the volume of the fluid displaced and the volume of the object. Here's the volume of the fluid displaced and the volume of the object. Here's the volume of the fluid displaced now, but here is now the whole volume of the object. So the volume of the fluid displaced, or the amount of the egg that was submerged, the F went down. And that's why the object had to rise to the surface. As soon as the density went too high, it pushed the egg up, causing part of the volume to be exposed to the air around it, and only part of the egg to be submerged, which lowered the volume of the fluid that has been pushed aside. Okay, so this continues to solidify what we said yesterday, okay? To validate that idea that as density of a fluid goes up, the object is going to start to rise up. Okay? If you keep adding salt to that water, that egg will eventually come up because its density becomes less than the water. That's what's happening there. Okay? Uh, well, let's talk about this first. And then we'll do example one, or example two. So, some things that have variable densities, how does a fish have a variable density? It has a swim bladder. It has a what? Swim bladder. What is it called? A swim bladder. Swim bladder, where it... Inflates. Ever see a blowfish before? They inflate. Okay? They change their volume. It's like a human. A human inhales the air. Now your density is lower. You exhale. Your density is higher. Third. Third. Liquid. I want to talk about this for a minute. If... If you are considering, or if you've signed up for forensic science, the third application is real cool, okay? So, a liquid can have a variable density. The way it can happen is this. You take a beaker or a graduated cylinder filled with water. You take... Well, I'm sorry, before you fill it with water. You take a certain amount of a substance like a salt, something that can be dissolved into water. You put a lot of it in the bottom of the beaker. You like fill like a third of it with it. You pour water slowly down the side as to not disturb the salt so that the water just slowly flows down the side and it starts to fill up. What will happen over a day or two is this. The bottom of that beaker will be very high density if you don't disturb it, if you don't mix it up. And as you go to the top, it will be lower and lower density. So the density is a function of height. So a piece of hair... <laughs> How could you possibly find out the density of a piece of hair? Bring it to a okay, how could you find out the density of a piece of hair? Can you find the volume of this hair? Yeah. Good luck finding the volume. Well, Anybody can find the volume. If you insist. Okay, you can't find the volume of this hair. <laughs> you probably can't find the mass of it either. Maybe the mass, because mass scales can get a little more fine. But watch, you know what I can do? I can make a variable graduated cylinder density liquid. Okay? And I could drop it in that liquid. And what will happen is this. It will start to sink. And it will pause. I have to like kind of probe it across the surface tension. I probe it into the water. Push it in. It will sink until it reaches the density of the water that's equivalent to the hair. And then what will happen? It will stop. Maria, come on, focus. This is your question. It will be suspended in the water at the exact density of the hair. So if you can somehow figure out the density of the fluid as a function of height and write the density along the side of it, you can determine that by dropping known object densities into it and seeing where they level off. So say an object with a density of 1.2 levels off right here and the hair levels off right here. And the hair is probably less than 1.2. It is less than 1.2. And you might be able to put markings if you drop a bunch of known objects in there to list what the densities are at certain heights. Depending on where this hair ends up, you now know the density of the hair. So this is a variable liquid density. Finally, hot air balloon we talked about already, okay? Depending on the heat that you release in the air or the amount of air that you release into the balloon, the density will change as the volume changes. Look at an example now. Calculate the actual weight, the buoyant force, and the apparent weight of an iron ball that is floating at rest in mercury. 
So please, right away, draw a mercury or draw a surface of liquid. Draw an object that's floating at rest. Okay, it's floating at rest in mercury. How much of the ball's volume is floating? So we're going to search for this quantity. The amount of it is floating. Okay, so here's the mercury beaker. Here's the mercury. Here's the amount of volume submerged in blue. Okay, blue is submerged. Black is the amount of the volume floating. Red is the actual mercury itself. It's made of iron. What do you suppose this is giving you about the iron ball? It's what? Anybody? What value is that? What, what, what variable is that representing? The ball's what? The iron ball's what? Density. It's density, it's mass, it's volume, it's circumference, it's radius. What is that? Look at the units. Cubic meters. What is measured in cubic meters? Volume. Thank you. Why did that take so long? Come on, people. How do you measure volume of a rectangular solid? Length times width times height. Isn't that a meter times a meter times a meter? Aren't the units meters cubed? Right away, you've got to know what this is. Come on. So this is the volume of the object. Again, the apparent weight of a 5 times 10 to the negative 5 cubic meter iron ball. This is describing the iron ball or the object. The object. The object. Next. To do this problem, what do you think we need to know? Mercury. Yeah, we need rho. Okay, we need rho of the object, the density of iron as a solid, and the density of mercury as a fluid. I will give you a table to look in, or I will give you the values in a problem. Here, let's assume you're given a table. I will tell you what they are for now. The density of the object is 7.86 times 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. The density of the fluid is 13.6. Oops. times 10 to the third kilograms per cubic meter. Will the object float or sink? Look at the densities. Why? So it sinks? If the object's density is less than the fluid, it will float. If the object's density is more than the fluid, it will sink. Okay, so this is floating in this case. I also drew in the diagram Picture of it floating. <laughs> yeah, tricky, huh? Yeah. But I was trying to get you to see the density portion, okay? From this portion alone, you should know whether it floats or sinks. Okay? Now, we want to find the weight of the object. How do I find the actual weight of an object? The weight of anything. MG. MG always. Now I'm going to put MO times G because it's the mass of the object. What is mass also written as now that we've taken today's lesson? Good, rho V. Okay, this will always give you the weight of an object because MO is the same thing as POVO. Okay, please remember that by now. It comes from your density formula. If you solve for mass, you get density times volume. We know those quantities. We know the density of the object. We know the volume. We know G. Plug them in. You get a weight of 3.86 newtons. Again, take the quantities above. Rho O times V O times 9.81, giving you the weight of the object. Which way will this weight act? It acts down. So I should really put a negative sign on here. And that's because gravity is negative. But if we were doing the sum of the forces, I would probably write Fb minus Fg. So that would already take into account the negative sign. But if I'm just writing it like this, I might want to put a negative. But if I said calculate the magnitude of the weight, <coughs> if I were to go back up to the problem, which I will do tonight and edit this so it makes more sense, and say calculate the magnitude of the actual weight. 
Okay? If I put the magnitude of it, I don't need that negative sign anymore. Magnitude really means just the value. I don't care about the direction. We know the direction is down. We will take that into account if we look at a free body diagram. For now, I found the magnitude of the magnitude of the weight of the object. The second part said this. Find the buoyant force acting on the object. What's the buoyant force on the object in this case? Please don't try and calculate it. It's the same. Why? Because if it's floating, If something is floating, it's at equilibrium, right? So the force of gravity pushing down has to equal the force of the water or buoyancy pushing up. So because it's floating, we can say that the force of buoyancy is equal to the force of gravity of the object, which equals 3.86 newtons as well. Again, you don't use math to find this part. You have to use conceptual knowledge. Whenever, whenever, whenever an object is floating, if you find the weight, you've also found the buoyant force. Write that down, please. When an object is floating, once you found the weight, you have the buoyant force. You already have the buoyant force. Stay with me, come on. We're almost done with this problem, then we're stopping there. The third part says how much of the ball's volume is floating. Let's go back to the diagram. I can't directly figure it out. It looks like half by looking, yeah. I can't directly figure this out. But if I could find the volume of the fluid that's been displaced, that is equal to this blue part right here, isn't it? Remember, the amount of my legs, here's water level. The amount of my legs underwater equals the volume of the fluid displaced. So if I could find VF, I could find the volume of the ball that's underwater. If I then subtract that from the volume of the ball overall, I'll get what's left up top. Again, this is the overall volume of the ball bearing. If I could find the volume of the ball that's been submerged and subtract it from this, I would get the amount that's being floated. Because the sum of floating and submerged has to equal the whole. So instead of finding the volume of the object submerged, let's find the volume of the fluid that's been pushed aside. So let's find VF in this next part. Oops, I did not mean to do that. Let's find VF in this next part. The only way I could find VF is looking at a free body diagram. This is where this comes into play. What acts up? What acts down? Or it's a gravity. If there's a balance, if it's floating, it equals? It equals? Zero. zero. It's in equilibrium. Formulas, plug it in. The force of buoyancy is rho F V F G. We've got F G O. I'm not going to put the variables in anymore. I could if I wanted to. I sure could. But I know what F G O is. Okay, F G O is 3.86. So this is one of the few times I'm going to plug in a number. It's not worth calculating again, right? Don't do all the work twice. I know that quantity. So let's go ahead and solve for VF. I add 3.86 to the right-hand side and then divide by rho FG. The quantity rho F times G. Rho F is known. It's the density of the fluid. The fluid in this case happens to be mercury. Its density is 13.6 times 10 to the third. Plug that in for rho F. Multiply that by 9.81. Then divide that quantity into 3.86. You get as an answer here 2.9 times 10 to the negative fifth. Cubic meters. This is the amount of the fluid that has been displaced, which is equal to the bottom portion of the ball, of that iron ball. That's what that is the volume equal to. If I know the total volume, okay, whoops, not two A's in total. If I know the total volume from the beginning of the problem was five times 10 to the five, negative five. Okay, that's the total. 
This is the part that's submerged, and I want to find the floating part. How can I do that? Subtract them. Again, total volume minus the amount of it submerged gives you the part that would be up here in this red circle, or this red semicircle, the amount of volume of the object that is currently floating above the water level. So 5 minus 2.9, just do that. You get 2.1, right? 5 minus 2.9 is 2.1, and then just tack on the 10 and the negative fifth. So the volume of the object that is floating is equal to 2.1 times 10 to the negative fifth. There is one more problem to do still, and I want to do that little egg thing. Tonight, you can start the homework. Just look at the problems. You'll know the ones you can do. You can try them out. Okay, there might be one that's a little tougher, but tomorrow we'll finish up with another example, and that egg part. The whole idea is this. You want to always think about a force balance, depending on the problem. In a problem where the object is stationary, F equals MA, right, becomes just the sum of the forces equals zero, because it's stationary. If you had a missile traveling from a submarine that was fired underwater, there's buoyancy pushing it up. There's gravity pulling it down. Well, it might also be accelerating. Maybe it's moving upward in a trajectory like this. So then you have to think about F equals MA and do a little bit of work with acceleration. For this problem, in the next part here, it's not going to be moving, so we set acceleration to zero. But if the object were moving, you have to consider its acceleration in the process. Okay? So can I get a reader for this one? Elliot, go ahead, nice and loud. An object with a density greater than salt water is dropped into the ocean. Alright, so pause there. It's greater than salt water, so what happens? It sinks. It sinks. Continue. It is angry at the ocean floor and then inflated, causing its density to decrease to a value less than salt water. The so what would want to happen then? It would rise. It would want to rise. Continue. The chain that is anchor experience is tension in the lens. What is the force of tension if the density of the object is 500 uh, kilograms per meters cubed and its volume is 20 meters cubed? Okay, and I should write the new density after it's been inflated. Okay, it's after it's been inflated we're talking about. I'm going to specify that in my notes with the word new density. Okay, now, again, object sinks to the bottom. It's anchored like so. Suddenly, you fill it with air. So now the object looks like this. And it wants to rise up because its overall density is now only 500, which is less than salt water. Salt water whose density is 1025, okay, which is needed for this problem. Does this make sense so far? Okay, so theoretically it makes sense. Now let's look mathematically. If this object is chained down to the ocean floor, like a buoy. This is a great example for a buoy. Okay, buoys are usually chained so that only part of that buoy is exposed to the water or exposed to the environment. Part of it is under the water. So it's chained down now. So these chains are still connected here at the bottom. Okay? But suddenly the density is much less so it wants to rise up. What equation can I write? What sum of forces equation can I write here? What are the forces acting on this? Gravity. Acting what? Up or down? down? Acting down. So I have this, right? That's my general equation. I've got gravity acting down. Um, buoyancy. Buoyancy, up. buoyancy acting up, so that's a positive. Mass. That's gravity, no? Yeah. The mass goes into gravity, right? But that's going to come from the weight. Remember, the mass of an object affects its weight, and we already took into account the force due to gravity, which is weight. There's one other thing. Come on, forces, forces. You can't answer with the word volume, right? The pulling force in the chain, or the force of tension in the chain, right? Look, it says, guys, experiences tension in the links. What is the force of tension? So that's what we're looking at. Why am I putting negative FT? The chain pull down. Think about it. I've suddenly inflated to a much larger volume. I want to go up. So the chains pull down. So the chains are helping out with gravity. The combination of gravity and the chains are holding it down. Now, is the object moving in this case? Yeah. Well, isn't it the chains are fixed. Oh, okay. 
So we say no, right? So we put a zero here at the end. Had the object been moving upward, been moving upward, you could have acceleration. Okay, but in that case, you wouldn't have chains and you wouldn't have a force of tension. Okay, but you could have, you could have an object moving upward and thus you have acceleration and you have to plug that in and multiply it by the mass. Okay, but in this problem you don't. I'm telling you that because one of your homework problems is a problem with a submarine and you're told that it's accelerating. So in that problem you do have acceleration. Okay, you do have acceleration. Now, what do we know about formulas? Force of buoyancy, what's the formula? Yeah. Rho VG. I got to put Fs there to signify that I'm looking at the fluid's density and the amount of fluid that has been displaced. Been displaced. I don't know anything about tension. What about gravity? Mg. Mg. All right, so far so good. But the only problem is I've got the density of the object and that's listed as 500 kilograms per cubic meter, okay? And I've got the volume of the object at 20 cubic meters. These are my givens up here at the top. Okay, I imagine I gave you salt water, which I will. Those are the given values. Do you see mass anywhere? Yeah. In, in the givens, in the givens. In the givens, there's no mass, but there is density and volume, right? So what should I replace M-O? with from yesterday's class what can you replace M with no Nick Rho times V be careful guys come on if you don't know here's what you do ready write down your definition of density and solve for mass right so by default mass becomes Rho times V and put O's there to represent the object's density and the object's mass Everything else remains the same still. Okay, again, this is replacing this mass right there. So that's my equation now. I know the density of the fluid. It's water. I know the density of the object. It's given. I know the volume of the object. I don't right now know the volume of the fluid displaced. I don't know gravity and I don't know the force of tension. Well, I mean, I know gravity because it's on Earth, right? So I know that number. What can you say about VF in this problem? What can you say about VF in this problem? Maria? Why? It's fully submerged in the water. Okay, again. Think about it, folks. I take the egg and I drop it in the water. What happens to the water level? It, goes up. it rises. The amount that it rises, that is VF. Well, the amount that it rises is equal to the volume of the egg. So when an object is fully submerged, we said this last class also, VF and VO are the same. When an object is fully submerged, the amount of water it pushes aside or displaces is equal to the volume of the object itself. We know the volume of the object itself. It was given as 20. So we know VF in this case. Does that make sense? You know VF because it's fully submerged. When it's fully submerged, VF always equals VO. Always, always, always. Because, think about it. If it weren't fully submerged, and if the egg were up here, the object were up here, now it only displaces how much water? That much water, right? That's the water it takes the place of. So the full volume of the object is not equal to the volume of the fluid displaced, only part of it. But when it's fully submerged, all this water that would be right here has been pushed aside and risen up. It has been displaced. So the volume of the object equals VF when submerged, fully submerged. All right, so our equation, let's move FT over by adding it. And our equation becomes rho F. And instead of writing VF, I'm just going to write V now. Okay, because there's no difference between V0 and VF anymore, so I just call it V. Just like when the mass 1 equals mass 2, we just call it M. Since volume of the fluid equals the vo volume of the fluid displaced equals the volume of the object, we just call them V. 
Now we can factor out V times G, very similar to what we did in the last class, except in the last class, we didn't have some tension force pulling back down. Okay? We had nothing right here. This was just equal to zero. So we divided by VG, and we got our answer in this case. But now, this but now we have, we're trying to figure out, again, what the overall force of tension is. This quantity of volume of 20, this quantity of 9.81 is fixed. It's not changing. These values here, the difference between them is what gives us the answer. Which is bigger? Was the density of the fluid bigger or the object bigger? Which of the two of them were bigger out of fluid and object for density? The fluid. The fluid was bigger. So this is going to be a bigger number than this, right? So you're going to get a bigger number minus a smaller number. You'll get a positive answer for tension, which makes sense. You have some tension. What if the object, what if the object had more density than the fluid? If an object is more dense than the fluid, what happens to it? It what? It sinks. Again, if an object's density is more than the fluid, it would sink. If this number were bigger than rho f, this would become negative. Would that make sense for your force of tension? You would have no tension. You would have zero tension, really, even though it would come up as negative, because the object would sink if you're on the ground. If the object is more dense than the water, it's sitting on the ground. The chains are not needed anymore, right? So when this is bigger, you get a negative answer, which doesn't make sense. It doesn't make your force of tension anything. It makes it negative in essence, which doesn't make any sense at all. It just means that gravity outweighs the buoyant force in that case. So in this case, we want to find out what our force of tension is. Let's plug in. The volume is 20. Gravity is 9.81. Okay. Rho F minus Rho O. What was rho f given as? That was the density of the fluid. Uh, 1025. So all water, good. Okay, 1025. And the density of the object is given as 500. Okay, but again, look at the numbers. Make sense of this, please. If this number was not 500, if it was more dense than water, you'd have a big number here, like 2,000. You'd get a negative answer for your force of tension. Which means that there is no force of tension. It's not actually acting on the object. Okay? But we do get a force of tension here. And our answer should be positive. Because we drew our force of tension acting down. We drew our force of gravity acting down. We drew our buoyant force acting up. The arrow already indicates that it's acting down. So I better get a positive answer to show that my arrow was correct. If I got an negative answer, we're really in tension is pushing up. Which doesn't make much sense at all. It means that the object keeps pulling through the floor, and the chains are now holding it up, okay? What do you get as a result? It's like 100,000 or something? 103,005. Yeah. That's the force of tension in the chains. If there were four chains, how would you find out the tension in each? Good. I almost said two chains, but I feel like you guys would have all said something, right? No. no. That, that's what I said until some of the baseball guys told me it's a rapper, right? No, don't you remember the conversation on the bus? I was like, who is this two chains guy? Does he actually have two chains? Is he wearing two chains? Anyway, so if there were four chains, you'd split in four, yeah. Okay? It's a complex problem.